Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Brass 101, Avalanche Safety Education from the Brass Foundation. Just a couple of housekeeping notes as we begin. If you have questions throughout the webinar, we will save time at the end, but you're welcome to pop a question into the chat or the Q&A box uh, whenever possible. Also, just to let you know, we are live streaming right now on Facebook Live. If you want to get a message off to any of your friends to have them uh, take a look. Uh, we would love to have them join us. Now, without further ado to kick it off, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the pioneers and founders of the Brass Foundation. Please welcome Cindy Burlack. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here with you today. I want to thank Tom Kelly so much for all your efforts in putting this amazing program together. Steve and I, along with Ronnie's sister, Carolyn, have a deep personal interest in sharing snow safety with you. In 2015, Ronnie and his good friend Bryce Astle were US ski team athletes on a race trip to Austria. They were taken from us in an avalanche skiing on lift serve terrain in the middle of a ski resort. They just did not have the knowledge to stay safe, nor did their coaches. We Burlaks and Astle families do not want any other family to go through what we have. So please listen carefully and talk to your buddies about what you learn here. We're proud to have Ben Merkin presenting today. He is a PhD and heads up the outdoor education program at Northern Vermont University. He's certified as both an airy avalanche instructor and as a mountain guide. He also pioneered this program with us and thank you so much, Ben. Remarkable about today with all the technology is that we have representatives from several avalanche centers between here and Austria. We're so pleased to have all of their participation and we are all united in our mission to keep you safe. Some of this content is spectacular and some of it is tough to watch. We hope it grabs your attention. Here's Ben. Thank you very much, Cindy and Tom. Um, I am Ben Merkin. I'm a professor at Northern Vermont University, teaching people to run ski resorts, become mountain guides, work for the US Forest Service, and much more. Uh, on the side, I work as a guide, as well as an instructor for ARI, the American Institute of Avalanche Research and Education. Um, I also teach some courses for the American Mountain Guides Association. I got interested in avalanches when I moved to Colorado and before the ski season had really started, someone I planned to ski with was killed in an avalanche. I instantly realized I was not in Vermont anymore and that I needed more knowledge. Brass, the Bronnie, Bryce Ronnie Athlete Snow Safety focuses on avalanche awareness for ski racers. This program is about enjoying the mountains and the most important, and most importantly, coming home safely at the end of the day. Tonight, we're gonna to try to give you a basic understanding of avalanches. The reason that we are here is because of a tragedy. The two young men you see here in this picture died in an avalanche accident, which was preventable and predictable. If they or their coaches had the right training and sent the message on the sent that message on that day and warned of the danger. In a few minutes, we'll watch a video called Off Piste that shows you the specifics of that tragedy. After that, I'll attempt to share with you some of the basic information about avalanches in hopes that it will help you to avoid them and or inspire you to learn more about them. We don't do this alone. A many thanks to these great people and organizations for helping bring this life-saving presentation your way. The vast majority of you are ski racers. You rip on skis and those two planks are a huge part of your life and who you are. You can ski better than 99% of the skiers in the world. You are drawn to steep slopes and you likely always will be. But steep slopes are avalanche terrain. You're here to learn more about how to avoid avalanche, how to avoid avalanches. 
This is by no means a comprehensive training, but more of a warning. The next thing we're gonna do is watch off piste. It is a reenactment of Ronnie and Bryce's accident staged at Snowbird with their ski patrol's cooperation. The interviews are with US ski team athletes and coaches who were at the accident and survived and family members. It is really sad to watch and incredibly, it was incredibly painful to make, but we did so to show you the importance of practicing avalanche safety whenever you go off piste. That means past the ropes in North America and off groomers everywhere else in the world. Here is off piste. Dispatch, possible two avalanche victims buried. I see something. Oh, oh, man. Man. Is this one of your friends? Yeah, that's Bryce. No pulse. Starting CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Lift on three. One, two, three. Are you sure there were only two? Yeah, there's two. Just two, just two. Okay, we're gonna find him. Ronnie! Not breathing, no pulse. Sorry, CPR. can turn deadly in a matter of seconds. It's hard to believe that such a tragedy could happen. The accident has left many in the skiing world in shock. Tragic news tonight as two elite skiers training for a spot on the U.S. Olympic team are killed in an avalanche. Rescue crews from Solden were on the scene immediately with multiple helicopters. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are apparently lost in this uh, specific incident. I'm Bryce Astle. How does the gangster chains play into effect in your slalom skiing? Um, pretty aerodynamic. I was shattered and I know everyone around me was too and can't even possibly imagine what it was like for the families. Losing Bryce and Ronnie was a huge hit to the US team. They're the next generation. These two guys were the best in their disciplines. Uh, Bryce in slalom, Ronnie in downhill and super G. They were the next up and comers. They could be the guys competing in the Olympics. This is the famous smile because uh, he had just won U.S. Nationals, juniors. He always had my back and it just, it makes you appreciate it more now that he's not here, you know? Bryce was such an important part of my life and after we lost him, it was a pretty easy decision for my wife and I to name our son Bryce. He lived for every moment. He would get done training and he would go out and he would ski. And this is a card that we made up at the time we lost the boys and it has Bryce so amazing on skis and Ronnie in his element going 70 miles an hour through the air. He was kind, and he was grounded. Ronnie, he was always just a jokester. He wasn't afraid of the, the World Cup vet. He would just always speak his mind to me, and I love that about him, you know? Watching him laughing just made me think, wow, I have the best brother ever. 
He was a good teammate, he was a good friend, a good son, and we had a lot of fun together. January 1st, 2015, I took Bryce to the airport. He was going to hook up with uh, Ronnie Burlack and the rest of the U.S. ski team. They were going to Europe to uh, train for uh, Europa Cup. We got to Solden, and it had just snowed a lot. Obviously, there's no training because there's so much snow. So we sent everyone out to go ski around and have some fun. Just seeing snow that's untouched and being like, this is a dream come true. We were having an amazing time. We could see the bottom of the valley. We could see the road. So we started skiing. I just remember skiing across this face, and all of a sudden, I just heard cracking. Everything underneath me started moving. I saw Bryce, and I heard him say, oh, shit. I never even saw Ronnie. We stood there, and we watched them go. Nothing made any sense. <laughs> then it just instinct took over, and there were people who had skied down right before us who saw everything and pulled out their transceivers. No, no beacon. No, no beacon. No, no beacon. No, no beacon. No, no ammo, no. it's equipment. I need shovels, I need shovels. That was when I realized how stupid we were being. OK, does anybody have a probe? We're at the bottom of Solden 1. We need a helicopter, two more patrollers, a hasty team, then AED. Probably took 15 minutes for helicopters to come in. I was like pretty aware that it had been too long. The first thing that appeared was Bryce's boots sticking up out of the snow. Go, go. He was upside down. His boot was six feet from the surface. Came across Ronnie a few minutes later. Ronnie, you got him. Did you get him out of the that hole? That was an image that I'll never forget. The concept of riding up a lift, skiing on a trail, and we're in danger, that did not exist in any of our heads. The coaches and the boys did not receive any orientation or any training regarding the dangers of skiing in Europe versus skiing in North America. None of the young men in that group knew the difference between on and off piece. Off-piste in the United States is defined as out of bounds, going through the gate, going under the rope. That's not what the rules are in Europe. When you are off the groomer, you are off-piste. In Solden, the day before the avalanche that killed Bryce and Ronnie, there had been heavy snowfall and strong winds. What that did was, is it put a lot of weight on top of the snowpack, which was fragile. Once these skiers got onto that slope, it couldn't support the additional weight. That weak layer fractured over a wide area, and that slab came crashing down. It produced debris that weighed almost 7 million pounds, the same as almost 10 747s. It takes all of 20 minutes to, to learn and to be educated. You want to make sure you're prepared. There are five points that are always really good to remember. You want to get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. First, you need the gear. Going in the backcountry, you need a beacon, a probe, and a shovel. And unfortunately, that day in Solon, the boys did not have that. I would have done anything for rescue gear, especially a shovel. 
you can always increase your chances of being surgible if you're unlucky enough to be caught in an avalanche by having reco reflectors in your equipment and clothing. Getting the gear is useless if you don't know how to use it. You've got to get the training. Take an avalanche class. If we would have taken just one class, we would have known not to ski down that terrain in the first place. One key thing you're going to learn in every avalanche class is that you have to check the forecast every time you ride. None of us checked the forecast that morning. It would have taken just two minutes on the gondola ride, and none of this would have happened. So when you're out on the snow, you got to get the picture. And what does that mean? That means pay attention. Are you seeing recent avalanches? That's by far the most important clue. That's like Mother Nature screaming in your ear. If we had known it wasn't controlled, we 100% would not have been there. Finally, get out of harm's way. What that means is only one person is riding the slope at a time. We were breaking one of the simplest rules. In some ways, it's a miracle that all six of us didn't die. Once you get to the bottom, you need to get out of the way. That way, if somebody else in your group triggers an avalanche, you won't be caught. These five simple steps everyone should know about and everybody should be trained in. Coaches, parents, athletes, administrators of the program. Everything that we did could have easily been prevented. I wish I could say that I couldn't have done anything to save their lives. That's just not true. Anytime you have a major accident like this, it causes a ton of introspective thought. We realized that we really needed to look at it from the top down, bottom up. How can we make sure everybody's more educated to avert and reduce the chance of anything like this ever happening again? That's why we at Brass are creating avalanche education specifically for coaches and athletes. We're also creating snow safety policies to be followed by ski racing groups. Ski racing is definitely a dangerous sport. But where we're going down is a really highly regulated area. You have all the fencing, you have the snow prep, you have all these things that are out there to keep you safe. When you get out there in the backcountry, there's, there's none of those luxuries. For the people who assume that just because they know how to ski terrain or they know how to rip down a mountain because they ski downhill, it's, it's a very different beast. Don't let this happen to you and your family. Get educated, get out there, so we can keep... ...keep skiing for Bryce and Ronnie, so their legacies live on. That video is incredibly difficult to watch every time. The reality of it and how permanent that moment is, is incredibly painful. Let's all take a deep breath and move forward together, learning in the memory of Ronnie and Bryce. Now it's time for your first pop quiz on Mentimeter. Um, so get into Mentimeter and do your best to answer that first question of how do avalanches form? Nailing it. Nice work, everybody. Yes, you are, you are correct. Um, avalanches do form with a weak layer in the snow. 
gets buried and more snow more snow piles on top and that weak layer eventually fails fails so snow builds in layers over time and the layers dictate how likely avalanches are to release oops sorry about that um in the following slides, we will specifically talk about how dry slab avalanches are formed. As all avalanches are not created are equal, all storms are different too. Some storms, the snow comes in light and fluffy, other storms come in with a bunch of wind, but perhaps things clear out and all this layering, uh, and all of this creates layering in the snowpack. Some layers are weak, some layers are strong, but it all looks the same when you're walking on it or riding on it. Oop. So why do we care? Let's forget about the layers. So what is an avalanche? There's a lot of different kinds of avalanches, but the kind that causes the most trouble are what we call dry slab av avalanches. A slab avalanche is like a monster in a horror film. It lies underneath the perfect facade, this enticing powder that's just waiting for a trigger to come along, like you, to collapse that weak layer, and then that collapse just goes, goes outwards in all directions. The slope just shadows like a pane of glass, there's no escape. It rockets down the hill, bounces you off trees and rocks on the way down, comes with you over a cliff. I mean, does any of that sound dangerous to you? I was not aware, and I did not comprehend the dangers that were out there that day. When I triggered the avalanche, it wrapped me up immediately. Not a second later, I was hit in the back with what well, felt like a truck. I didn't even have a chance. I ended up laying there in the snow with two broken femurs and my broken left arm for between seven and eight hours. I had a total of four surgeries, still in therapy three days a week, trying to learn how to walk again and get use of my body again. Avalanches are very violent events. One out of four people are killed by the trauma of hitting trees and rocks on the way down. And after they tumble you to the bottom, then the avalanche debris instantly sets up like concrete. You can't just pop off out of this. Somebody else has to get you out of the snow. Really fun day. It was beautiful powder snow, blue skies, sunshine, just pow shots, nothing extreme. We were trying to get gnarly or anything. Came around the corner, dropped in. It was great. And then saw cracks shoot out all around me. I did see like the sky for a moment and then just a whole wave of snow went over my face. And I had like a moment of, ah, maybe I can just punch through to the top. And as soon as I tried to move at all, I realized that I couldn't even bend a finger. All right, so um, I have a five, Tom just added that code 5790511 for folks that, that need that. And we'll have some more ment Mentimeter slides coming up. So it takes a little investigation to see what's going on in the snow. Here we have a strong, slick, thick slab on top of a very weak layer. Just like building a house, you don't want that concrete foundation uh, on the second floor. Same is true of the snowpack. So why do we care? Well, we might forget about these layers when the storm comes in and covers them over. We're psyched to get out and then bam. You can't feel and see this very, weak, this very weak layer of sugary snow, which in this case is facets or what's called depth ore. Um, so you don't know that it's there unless you're investigating. But with a little investigation, as you can see from that little clip, it doesn't, you don't have to be a snow scientist to recognize it. Um, but we'll talk more about getting the forecast later and they'll explain all of those ideas. Uh, this picture here is from the Northeast, a spring slide from Tux a few years ago, and it was a really large avalanche. Fortunately, no one was injured in that slide. However, we do regularly have avalanche fatalities in the Northeast. Um, we're about to transition into talking about avalanche terrain, and I just want everyone to know that we, we have 
some here in Vermont around Mount Mansfield. And there is a lot of avalanche terrain in the whites beyond Tux. And seeing that new book come out about skiing in the presidentials has me nervous because all, almost all of that terrain in that book is avalanche terrain. And it is really wonderful terrain, but it deserves your respect and it requires your knowledge. Terrain is key to understanding avalanches. Those numbers you see are represent slope angles in these different areas. We're gonna talk more about this idea of slope angle because steepness is the most important terrain factor. Um, most avalanches occur between 35 and 50 degrees. The problem is that's right where it's really fun to ski. Slopes less than 30 degrees usually aren't steep enough to slide and slopes steeper than 50 degrees usually slough often enough to not build up and turn into slabs. A black diamond slope at a ski area is usually about 35 to 40 degrees and is probably what you're looking to ski most of the time. Okay, I got another question for you here. Um, where could we hang out safely and enjoy the view on this, on this terrain feature? All right, people are just starting to answer about where we could. It's a little more or a little less. Uh, let me get my share going here. Here we go. Yeah, so. We are starting to see um, people, it, yeah, it is. So near the trees on the left and the upper side, it could see how you would say that if we were over the ridge on that far side here, I'll reshare that slide. But yeah, the far right side of the, uh, of the slide is the correct or best answer um, for this particular um, area in this particular time. Uh, so, like we were saying that if we were up here on the ridge beyond those trees, that would be a great spot. But no, the far right side here, um, the trees is the place we would want to be. The steep middle part of the bowl is obvious avalanche terrain and it's where it's uh, a slide is most likely to start. You also need to think about not just what's underneath you, but what is connected. For instance, you may be standing on something slightly less than 30 degrees, which would rarely slide on its own, but you can trigger a slide on a locally connected adjacent 40 degree slopes. A collapse of a weak layer can, can propagate outward to the steeper, steeper slopes and trigger an avalanche, which may pull your slope down along with the steeper one. Another way to think about connected terrain is that it's like a huge pile of logs. If you pull out that bottom log, the entire pile comes crashing down. The danger of the terrain depends both on steepness and consequences. Getting strained through trees at, a free, at freeway speeds accounts for many avalanche deaths every year. Remember, if the trees are spaced wide enough to comfortably ride through, they are no longer anchors for the snowpack. These pictures are four examples of what we call terrain traps. Essentially, if you get caught in an avalanche above these kind of slopes, it's likely to lead to bad consequences. Hitting an obstacle on the way down, going over a cliff, or being buried deeply in a terrain trap. It's just a fun little video that emphasizes some key ideas.
Okay, this is huge. There are key differences in re resort versus backcountry, but also in the US versus Europe. The second you go through the gate, you are in the backcountry. The difference between riding in a ski resort and riding in the backcountry is really night and day. In a ski resort, we use explosives and terrain closure to minimize the risk of avalanches to our customers. But outside the ski area, once you step just two feet over that rope line, you're in a totally different environment. Anybody that's going into the backcountry or thinking about going off piece at a resort really needs to understand that it's a totally uncontrolled environment. There isn't any ski patrol. Uh, they're not bombing or doing any avalanche control. It can be really dangerous. So essentially, you need to be you know, your own avalanche expert. So in nine out of 10 avalanche fatalities, they're triggered by the victim or somebody in the victim's party, which is actually good because it's not like getting struck by lightning. We have a choice. That means if we learn something about avalanches, we can avoid getting caught in avalanches. Once you cross that rope line of a resort and exit or exit the resort gate, you are in the backcountry. The backcountry is much different than the resort. Um, there's no control work and no easy rescue. Even inbounds after storms, there can be serious avalanche danger. Last year, there were four inbounds avalanche fatalities in the US. The side country, as people sometimes like to call it, is the backcountry. All terrain outside resort boundaries where there's no avalanche mitigation is backcountry terrain. Doesn't matter that you can see the ski run or the lift. Um, if you're outside that gate, you're in avalanche, you could be in avalanche terrain. Uh, there's a lot of different ways these boundaries are marked with signs or rope lines, but just remember that it is a separate world. It's like watching grizzly bears at the zoo. On one side of the fence, you're pretty safe. Once you step over that fence in with the grizzly bear, not so safe. Um, you don't wanna be in that grizzly cage. May look soft and cuddly, just like powder, um, but it may not be. In that case, you have to be your own avalanche forecaster and rescue team. Doesn't matter if their lifts are running and there are tracks ahead of you. Okay, we have a Mentimeter Another Mentimeter question here. What does off-piste mean in Europe? Yeah, you all are, are, are nailing this one, um, for sure. When you travel outside the US, avalanche control is very different. On piste is a marked patrolled ski run that outside of the North America, you know, it's just groomed runs. This is equivalent to inbounds where in the US. Off piste simply means outside of the ski run. And that is how literally you should take it. This area is ungroomed unmarked and has no avalanche mitigation. When you leave a ski run, a groomed ski run in Europe, you are off piste. That also includes the few feet next to the ski run in fresh snow. Often you can ski just beyond the markings without any problems, but avalanches have originated next to the run. In short, off the maintained ski run, is off piste. Uh, this is just a quick video demonstrating the ability of an avalanche to propagate or shoot across the slope. There we go. Oh, nicely done. Nice, nice. Oh, look at that. Good. 
amazing the power. Know before you go, simplifies avalanche education into five easy steps, which we will now go through in a bit more detail. First, get the gear. These are the basics, the essentials for traveling in avalanche terrain. Basic avalanche rescue gear includes an avalanche transceiver or beacon, probe, and shovel. The beacon leads to the probe, the probe leads to the shovel, the shovel leads to your partner. You need to practice this a lot to have any chance of pulling off a successful rescue. Avalanche safety can seem totally overwhelming, you know, but there is a systematic step-by-step -step process that can keep you alive in avalanche terrain. Just knowing five basic things can prevent most avalanche accidents. Get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. Everyone who goes into backcountry avalanche terrain needs basic avalanche rescue gear. You need an avalanche transceiver, a shovel, and a probe. And you need to practice a lot to know how to use all of this gear, because your friend only has about 15 minutes to live buried beneath the snow. A lot of people also use an inflatable avalanche airbag backpack that will help them rise to the top of avalanche debris. How well does this avalanche rescue gear actually work? Well, for one out of four people killed in an avalanche, they're gonna die from trauma. They're gonna hit trees or rocks on the way down the slope. So avalanche rescue gear isn't gonna do anything for them. The rest of them die from asphyxia, from breathing their own carbon dioxide underneath the snow. But it doesn't have to be that way. If everyone wore an avalanche airbag backpack, as well as an avalanche transceiver, two out of three people who die from asphyxia would still be alive. The bottom line is avalanche rescue gear will only save about half of us. But in order to stack the odds in my favor, I make sure to never go skiing without them. As sledders, we travel in the backcountry a little bit differently than skiers, but I still need to have my avalanche gear attached to my body. Having it attached to my tunnel does me no good. If I get separated from my sled, I get separated from my safety gear. If your buddies that you ride with don't have the training and the equipment, don't let them ride with you. Getting the gear is important, uh, like having a safe vehicle, but you still try really hard to avoid getting in crashes, right? Same idea is true in the avalanche world. Another quick video here. So all the equipment is really helpful. It's combined with practice and the mindset of minimizing risk. One of the scary things about avalanche gear is that it's shown to be associated with riskier behavior. Just like you may drive slower if you know you don't have a seatbelt, you may make riskier decisions with an avalanche airbag. And that's something you have to keep in mind with the people you're skiing with and be open to talking about. All right, practice, practice, practice. Uh, many areas have transceiver parks, depending what part of the country you're in. Most pros practice transceiver searches once a week. Most ski patrollers have a bunch of transceivers buried on the hill for their own practice in certain places that aren't avalanche prone. Um, 
And they don't mind other people using their setups to practice. If you ask a patrol in an area that does a lot of avalanche control, they'll most likely let you use their setup to practice. You can also take courses in that, obviously, as we'll get to later. A real rescue is scary, stressful, confusing, and can happen in really harsh conditions. The only way to keep your head in those conditions is to practice. You want to ski with a crew of knowledgeable people who have each other's backs and practice making good decisions. The whole group, all of you have the training. So now that you've got the gear, you've got to get the training. So when you take an avalanche course, you're basically getting keys to a whole new world. You'll learn about avalanche terrain, snowpack, weather, rescue. Essentially, you're trying to take the guesswork out of travel in avalanche terrain. As a first timer just coming in, it's really important to take the right classes and gain all the knowledge before going out in the backcountry. Getting the training isn't just taking an avalanche class. It's a great start, but really it's about practicing what you've learned. You know, make it a ritual. Make it fun. You know, throw down some lunch money and do some time drills. You know, when it comes down to it, it's about having your friends back and knowing that they have yours. It's not just the skiers that need to get the training because sleds are taking us further into the backcountry. So we really need to bring our avalanche skills up to the level of our rider skills. Next, you gotta get the forecast. These avalanche forecasters are pros. They're going to tell you everything you need to know. They're going to tell you about the snowpack. They're going to tell you about the weak layers. They're going to tell you where avalanches are going to happen, where you can likely avoid avalanches. All that information is one click away. To get the avalanche forecast, visit avalanche.ca in Canada or avalanche.org in the States. Before I even get on the snow, I check my local avalanche advisory. So take the time, get the forecast. So regardless, wherever you travel, get the avalanche forecast. Understanding what the avalanche problem is, even just a little, even just a little bit of knowledge could help you avoid getting in trouble. This presentation is not avalanche training. Take a field-based avalanche course to learn the basics of avalanche safety. Learn how to manage your risk and take care of your friends. There are lots of public and private entities that provide avalanche training. Check avalanche.org um, or avalanche.ca for avalanche education resources. Feel free to contact me directly through NVU. Always happy to Northern Vermont University. Always happy to uh, help you find the best instructors around for your course. Um, ARI is kind of the big provider uh, certainly in the Northeast, the biggest provider, and then there are others out in the West in a variety of uh, smaller outfits that do excellent jobs. Look, make sure they're accredited by the AAA, the American Avalanche Association. These last three points you do every time you go into the backcountry. This is how the pros roll in this step-by-step -step process that we will review in the next 30 or so minutes is a huge factor in helping people manage risk. The easiest piece of information you can get from the advisory is the danger rating, but that's only one piece of the puzzle and it can be misleading. The levels are kind of like a traffic light, green, yellow, red days, but it is more nuanced than that. The scale is not linear, and in general, as the, the danger increases exponentially as you go up. This is a general rating, but if you read the details of the advisory, you can get a more detailed description of the danger, where to find it, what clues to look for, and this becomes especially relevant once you've had additional training on how to read and interpret that bulletin. This is a big oversimplification over of what these ratings mean, but it's a good rule of thumb. Moderate, however, is where a great many accidents occur. It is really tricky. Different avalanche problems have different consequences. 
which in a full-blown course, you would spend a few hours discussing. Um, but know that even in moderate, if the problem is something like deep slab or persistent slab, people who know what they're doing don't ski in avalanche terrain. These are low probability, but very high consequence events. And you just want to avoid them. Avalanche forecasts give you a lot of good information about where to go and how to stay safe. There are different types of avalanches, as we were just saying, and you can see that in the forecast. It talks about what the problem type is, where you can find it, how big it is, how likely it is. Um, this information is really key to understanding where you should go. For instance, in this forecast that we see up here, we can see that if we're on southwesterly aspects, we're managing our risk for this avalanche problem. Um, this is another forecast center where they present the graphics, same information, but just presented a little differently. Um, there are nuanced differences with different avalanche centers, but the basic messages uh, tend to be clear if you know what you're reading for and you interpret them carefully. Pros tend to write it all down in their field book so that they don't forget what's happening or what they read when they're looking down the barrel of a big, slot, a big shoot of powder. Get the picture, the mental picture of what's going on and how it relates to you and your group. Pay attention to everything you see and note when things seem odd. Talk to your partners about what it is you see. When you're traveling in the backcountry, you've got to get the picture. What's that mean? It means pay attention. Look for recent avalanches. Listen for cracking or whomping that's taking place around you. Look for recent storm snow, wind-loaded snow. Look for rapid thawing. If you look for all these things, you're going to get the picture. You're going to be a safer backcountry skier. First, do other tracks mean the slope is safe or does it mean someone else just got lucky? Remember, you should first get the gear, get the training before venturing into the backcountry. Once you're ready to do that, and when you are in the mountains, look around. There are obvious things to look for that tell us if the avalanche conditions are dangerous. Now we're gonna discuss some of these red flags to look out for. The most obvious sign of avalanche danger is recent avalanches on slopes similar to the type of terrain you want to ride. Do they face the same way? Are they the same steepness, elevation, etc.? When you're out in the backcountry, you need to always be on the lookout for this clue, clue number one, recent avalanche activity. Okay, Mentimeter, question. What is that woomph sound? While it might be a friend landing huge air, most of you are right that it is a weak layer of snow collapsing. Um, we'll often hear that woomph walking in a field around campus or um, on your skin in. When you hear it on your skin in, it should be a real wet red flag because it is. That's that weak layer collapsing. And if you were in avalanche terrain, that could be the initiation of an avalanche. That weak layer collapses and it propagates. So in this picture, lots of wind drifted snow is forming a cohesive pile, also known as a slab. Which way do you think that wind is blowing? Going from the right side of the screen to the left and piling up in what we call the lee, um, really piling up there. 
So watching out for that recent wind loading. If you live in the Northeast and you read the Mount Washington Avalanche Center's forecast, about 80% of the time, wind slab is our primary problem. We have a lot of wind and it moves snow around and causes some pretty touchy uh, avalanche problems. Anytime you're skiing a bunch of fresh snow, there is likely instability. When we add weight to a snowpack, especially quick, quickly, it creates instability. If you think about holding a, a tray over your head, if people pile things on that tray, say one glass at a time, you're gonna be able to support it. But if somebody drops a 45 pound weight on that tray, it's likely to collapse. The same is true of the snowpack. That weak layers underneath, if we get a gentle snow coming in steady, it may be able to adjust and support that. But when we get those heavy dumps, there is big instability and it is incredibly touchy very frequently. Another red flag is rapid warming. Big changes in temperatures, especially with things getting above freezing are the fifth red flag. Anytime that you're in the backcountry and things are getting above freezing and they've been below freezing for a while, be really cautious. Um, and some also argue there's a sixth red flag that we don't include here, which is persistent slab. Uh, so watching out for that whenever you read an avalanche forecast, you see those words. Know that those words are, are scary ones for those in the know. So now we know how to spot signs of avalanche danger. The last step is to get out of harm's way. Every time you go out, you need to understand the avalanche forecast, the avalanche problem, the terrain you'll be in, and be able to match your travel plans to this. These photos are from April 20th, 2013. A group of experienced backcountry users were traveling at the very bottom of an avalanche path. They thought they were practicing safe travel techniques. They were spread out about 50 feet apart. Unknown to them, they were dealing with a deep, persistent, weak layer. They thought they were too far away to remotely trigger a slide on this weak layer. It turns out they were wrong and their travel techniques were not appropriate for this deep, persistent, weak layer. They triggered a very large, what's called a D3, destructive size, slide with the avalanche, and with an avalanche of this size, their distance of 50 feet was not enough. And six people were caught, five of whom were killed. The photo on the left is the debris pile. And the photo on the right was a burial location with a victim buried 15 feet down. You get out of harm's way in the backcountry by first avoiding suspect slopes and terrain to begin with. We don't want to regroup in avalanche paths and we don't want to stop or regroup in runout zones. Some of my best advice I can give you is when we're out hill climbing and there's a bunch of us, don't go park right at the bottom in the avalanche path. Park on the outside, stay out of harm's way. Just like you ski a slope one person at a time, once you're at the bottom, get out of the way of the avalanche path. Yeah, so don't hang out anywhere where you could get hit by an avalanche. If you or your partners are buried in it by an avalanche, there's no one there to dig you out. Get out of harm's way from avalanches that could be coming down from above includes being in the track of the runout of avalanches. And it's likely larger than you expect. Only put one person on that slope at a time. If your riding partner gets stuck in an avalanche, do not ascend into the terrain trap to help them. This puts you both at risk. Sorry, if your riding partner is stuck in avalanche terrain, do not ascend into the terrain. This puts you both at risk. I ski 100% of the time with radios. It makes communication easy. Before a run, we say eyes and ears on. And we ski one at a time down through this avalanche terrain. It's good to think about what you'll do if the path does slide. Where will you go? Could you try to ski out of it to a side? 
Having that plan is important as well as being sure that you're stopping out of the runout zone. It is an incredibly common mistake to stop too soon or not far enough out of the way. These things often go bigger than we would ever expect or imagine. Okay, Mentimeter time. What's wrong with first with the photo on the left? Uh-oh, we might need some review here. Skier being alone is a good thing if he's in avalanche terrain or if they are in avalanche terrain. The skin track where this person on the left is skiing is definitely avalanche terrain. Um, and that is the problem. The ski track is in avalanche terrain. It's a bad skin track choice. Um, where they could clearly ascend this ridge here and avoid going into this terrain. And if they deemed the, the slope reasonable, drop in from above. So how about this photo on the right? What's wrong with this? Before I switch over, you can, you can now work to the next. What's wrong with the photo on the right? Our next Mentimeter question. I do agree etiquette wise that the fact that their tracks aren't spooning, they're not doing the best at their powder conservation. But the real issue here is the group is all waiting right in the slide path. Um, so we don't want to see that. We don't want our partners waiting for us in the slide path. Uh, they are not spread out or descending one at a time. This is a really tough one to talk about, people. People have evolved in complex cognitive ways to take in and process large and constant streams of information we receive from the world around us. Additionally, we are social beings. How we interact with others and our needs at some level to fit in is powerful and generally unconscious, but it drives our behavior. We call our cognitive and social aspects that influence our behavior and ultimately our decision process, human factors. There are many ways to identify group and counter human factors, but it requires that we acknowledge they exist and that we work hard to counter them. I have been backcountry skiing for over 20 years and I admittedly still struggle with this every time I go out. I do a lot of homework. I write a lot of things down so that I can help myself to resist making bad decisions. The human factor is really powerful. This is also a constantly evolving conversation in the field of behavioral economics um, and the study of how the brain works and how we interact with groups. It is a complex issue, but all people want to fit in. All backcountry skiers are out there to have fun and that can lead to poor decisions. The drive to remain part of the group or just to behave and define ourselves around others is powerful and usually unconscious. Peer pressure, the desire for acceptance, social proof, feelings of scarcity, or a need to express individualism can drive us to make poor decisions or not see all the information for what it is. As we move toward wrapping this up, I want everyone to think about what the most important aspect or component of being a good backcountry user is.
Your ability to communicate and be part of a team is key. Do your part to manage the risk by doing your homework beforehand and then speaking up with what you see or you are concerned about. The best question you can ask someone who wants to ski in avalanche terrain may simply be, what makes you think this is safe? And that's an honest question. It's a good question. I love when I'm asked that because it challenges me to express logically why I'm making the decision I am. The person who can't answer that question may not be someone you wanna follow into that consequential terrain. We want you to realize that avalanches are dangerous, but you can avoid getting caught in them. First, get the gear, but then you've got to get the training before ever going into the backcountry. Next, always check your local avalanche forecast so you can anticipate the given avalanche conditions for the day. You can get the picture by looking for the obvious signs of instability, and you'll be getting out of harm's way by managing your exposure to potentially hazardous slopes. A lot of times when people watch us in the films, all they see is the action of us shredding these big lines. But what you don't see is the behind the scene, all the prep that goes into making sure that the slopes are safe, checking out the snowpack, waiting for snow to settle, doing all the homework it takes to safely rip the big lines. All this information is great and incredibly practical. But at the end of the day, if you feel uneasy about something, it's about having the courage to say no and walk away. The mountain isn't going anywhere. It doesn't matter if you've made thousands of good calls. All it takes is one bad call, and that's one too many. Some days, the mountains are screaming, get out of here. And some days, the mountains are going, come on in. It's time to party. In the past hour, um, we have I've put a lot of information in front of you. Uh, now we have a few minutes to uh, take questions. So you can put them here in the chat box. Um, I also have some good questions that were asked last time that I can review. Um, avalanches are these low probability, high consequence events. They kill people indiscriminately. You're People who love skiing and love life. So we very much encourage you to get additional avalanche training with, with your ski friends and make good decisions with a crew that you trust. While we wait for uh, other questions to appear in the chat box, uh, I'm gonna go through a couple that um, were given to us in the last, um, webinar that we did. And one was asked, do we care, do I carry avalanche gear inbounds when I'm skiing at say a Western resort with avalanche control and avalanche, um, good avalanche mitigation? And the answer is I do after a storm. If I'm actually a couple of years ago, I was in Jackson Hole and it was a big dump, big storm day. And I was getting ready to go and hadn't packed my beacon probe and shovel. I hadn't put it on me. I was thinking resort. And my partner looked at me and basically shook his head and said, what are you doing? Um, and it really was a wake up call for me and made me think about it. And uh, now on storm days, definitely, um, definitely carrying beacon probe and shovel on big storm days in avalanche prone areas. Other questions was, does it help to have a beacon without the probe or shovel? Um, the beacon makes you searchable. 
which is great if you're at a resort and the people you're with have a probe and shovel. But without that probe and shovel, you're not much of a partner. A lot of being in the backcountry is about partnership. It's about relationships. It's about taking care of the people you're with. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to, to have all three at the very minimum, beacon, probe, and shovel. Another question we had last time was about how do we find, how do you find the avalanche forecast in Europe? Those of you traveling over to race in Europe. Um, and uh, the one easy way throughout Europe is avalanches with an S at the end of avalanche.org. Um, and uh, that has lots of um, information uh, and avalanche, links to avalanche forecasts throughout Europe. Thank you all for being, oh, ah, so we have a question. What about thoughts about RECO from, from RECO, sorry, from Pat Scanlon. Thanks, Pat. Great point. Um, RECO makes you searchable. So essentially that little thing that's hidden in your pants um, or your gloves or your jackets, it makes it so they can find you. However, it doesn't make it so your partners can find you. It makes it so that a professional with a special device can find you. Um, to my knowledge, the majority of times that a RECO is used, it is in a body recovery and not a rescue. The time it takes to get the people with the proper equipment in place is if someone is fully buried, is usually too much for them to live. Uh, and that's a, uh, I don't know the actual statistics on that. Uh, I just, I've heard of one that I know of rescue based on a RECO and it was because they had a good air pocket. Um, so yeah. Uh, do you recommend an inReach? I love my inReach. I carry a little inReach with any inReach mini with me every day. Um, Essentially, in an avalanche situation, if someone were fully buried in my party, I would, if I had a large group, I would immediately send an inReach SOS, um, knowing that we have a life-threatening situation. And then I'd follow up with, with a message about the specifics. Um, so yes, I think an inReach is great uh, as long as the person who's carrying it is the one buried. Uh, generally, uh, inReach is a wonderful product from what I can tell. Um, what is your favorite, is this slope safe rule of thumb? Um, my favorite rule of thumb is, is all about slope angle. Less than 30 degrees, I feel good. Often in the springtime, when we've gone through a, what we call a melt freeze cycle, or we've had several days where it gets warm and then cold, warm and then cold, and then that snowpack melts and freezes and melts and freezes, it becomes really cohesive. Um, and then slab avalanche possibilities are, are much lower. Uh, those are big, is this slope safe rule of thumb? Um, and, you know, trust your avalanche forecasters. They are the experts. If I see low from my avalanche forecasters, it doesn't mean there's not avalanche danger. It doesn't mean I shouldn't carry my beacon probe and shovel, but it does mean that the risks are much lower. So the, the, if there are going to be avalanches, they're typically going to be quite small and they're going to be more difficult or stubborn to trigger. Do you need a tool to take with you to determine slope angle? Great question. So again, in an avalanche course, you'll learn about all of this. So a lot of what we do is homework at home. Right, so there are specific mapping tools. One is something that's free called CalTopo, C-A-L-T-O-P-O.com. And you can click a little button that says slope angle shading and it will shade the slope with avalanche terrain. It is a few degrees off, right? Like any te technological tool, it has a margin for error. Uh, but that's one way before you leave your house to determine if where you're going is avalanche terrain and or if you're going to be crossing the runout zone of avalanche terrain. Those are great ways to um, plan and think about what you're going to do. But then there's also, you can get apps on your phone. Mammut has a safety app 
that gives slope angle that I use all the time on my phone. Um, there's a bunch of apps that do that. Um, also on my compass, there's an inclinometer it's called, and that is um, provides uh, slope angle measurement, really nice. Uh, but there's tons of apps. There's a bunch that you can look down a slope from above and just essentially take a picture and it will tell you um, the slope angle. And I think, um, oh, the, the peeps beacon default. I'm not gonna go there. You can read about that for, for a long time. They've been having, having some issues. Generally over the years, peeps has produced quality products. Um, every beacon uh, takes some getting used to. And the, I think the important thing to do is get a three antenna beacon and practice with it. Know the idiosyncrasies of your beacon, know how to use it, know how to use it to minimize risk for yourself and others. The more that you use it, uh, the better you'll be with it. Um, for information with uh, on snow Abbey training, airy.org, there's a schedule of courses listed. Um, and courses are filling up incredibly quickly this year. Um, I know I posted my, I'm only teaching three public courses this year. I posted them in September and all of them were full in the first like four days in September that I posted them. Um, yeah, avalanchetraining.org, there you go. Thanks, Tom. Um, you can also, you should know that if you have a group, so group size for any course leader is six people. If you have a group that you ski with, call a course leader and arrange a custom course. I think that is absolutely the best way. I love doing courses for groups of people who want to, who are going to ski together, train together, practice together. Um, course leaders are psyched to do this. It also, in the time of COVID, is really minimizing risk. Um, ask those questions if you're going to do snow training this year. Uh, I know for my courses, we're doing an online component, two different Zoom sessions in the evenings, and then two field days. And those field days were meeting outside and staying outside the whole time, which is a tall order um, on Mount Washington. I'm really hoping people come well geared with positive attitudes and uh, resilient, resilient folks. Other questions? I don't know if Tom or Cindy want to get on and wrap things up, but I want to thank you all for being part of this. And thanks to our sponsors. Uh, and um, anyone can feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, and appreciate you being part of Brass. Thanks so much, Ben. That was amazing. We really appreciate all your knowledge, your deep knowledge. And uh, Tom, do you want to say anything? Um, you go ahead and say some closing words and then I'll uh, adjourn everything. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to thank a couple of groups that have been particularly uh, supportive of our, our efforts to put on Brass 101 and some of them are listed here. It's Blizz, Blizz, Technical Blizzard, Utah Avalanche Center, World Cup Supply, RECO, and Backcountry Access. We're so appreciative to all of you and what you've contributed. We have three more Brass 101 sessions, so please tell any of your friends who could benefit from this information. All of it in the information about the sessions is on our website, which is brassavalanche.org, and you click on education and all of the links and the times and, uh, are, are listed there. So thanks so much for being part of this and uh, really hope that you enjoy the snow, but enjoy it safely. Thanks so much, Tom and Ben. Take care. Great. Thank you very much, Cindy. And thank you, Ben, for putting on this great workshop here today. And all of you who participated, if you have any pictures or video, please send them to us. As Cindy indicated, we do have three more Brass 101 scheduled. You can get the info at brassavalanche.org. And we also are doing a very interesting panel at uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time on November 18th, where we will have leading avalanche experts and industry experts talking about the big rush to the backcountry that we're anticipating this year. Uh, so plan on tuning in on that for that. That is also free. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Look for more inf information on brassavalanche.org. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>